within the big city of Carcassonne. There are several stores and restaurants there. The most impressive thing to see is the museum. France is a secular country. In contrast to the watered-down museums of the Inquisition in Lima, Peru, or Cartagena, Colombia, the cruel role of the church in the crimes of that horrendous and savage tribunal stand out in stark reality at Carcassonne. We find there the original instruments of torture, the Iron Maiden, which was an iron coffin with long spikes that pierced the heretic's eyes and vital organs when closed around them. We find also the chairs of nails where suspected heretics were trapped in the, if they refused to denounce their friends and brothers in faith. I had visited that museum about 14 years earlier. I saw that some of the harsher testimonies linking the Roman Catholic Church to those old crimes have now been quite washed away. For example, there is no longer a war sculpture of an inquisitor who became later Pope. He was a Cistercian monk named Jacques Fournier. He condemned Cathars, Waldensians, poor men of Lyon, and others reform, other reformers to be burned at the stake. He forced Jews to be baptized under torture and condemned those who refused to swear because they understood that swear, swearing contradicted the requirements of the gospel. He felt free to resort to deception to find and condemn heretics. Other popes were formerly grand inquisitors who tortured and burned heretics alive and continued doing it after becoming popes. Among them were Paul, IV, Paul IV in 1555, Pius V in 1566, and Sixtus V in 1585, and Alexander VII in 1655. Pius V was one of the most ruthless of inquisitors, but was himself beatif beatified and canonized as a saint by Pope Clement VII, VII in May 22, 1712. We find another example of such persecution in the Argentinian clergy during the Dury War, which uh, was backed in Argentina by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic priest, Christian, von Fernick was eventually convicted for participation in seven murders, 31 acts of torture, and 42 kidnappings. This in modern times. Inquisitor Jacques Fournier, who would become later Pope Benedict XII, condemned an Albigensian preacher, Peter Othier, to be burned alive at the stake in front of the cathedral of St. Stephen in Toulouse. The final request of this Qatar preacher was to be allowed to testify of his faith to the multitude. He believed that if the people would listen, they would accept his message. His request was refused. It was Jacques Fournier who founded what was called a genius of deception in order to capture Guillaume Bellibaste, one of the last Qatar preachers. He made Arnold Seeker a wealthy man by sending him to a secluded region in the south of the Pyrenees, where a small band of Albigenses took refuge. There, Arnold feigned to be converted. When he visited them a second time, he asked Bellibaste to go to provide consolation to a friend of God who was dying. Along the way, they seized the preacher. However, Jacques Fournier did not have the pleasure of lighting the fire that consumed him, because the Pope argued that Bellibaste was from Corbier and had to be judged and condemned there. Do we need further testimonies to identify the medieval prince prophesied by Daniel as being a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue? The prophet added, He will cause this seed to prosper, and he will destroy many, Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 and 25. 
Throughout the 1200 years of medieval history, such incidents were too common to number, revealing the true character and nature of such a colossal authority. After seeing all the original instruments of torture housed in that museum, we can only shudder from the repugnant impact of the waxed sculpture of that inquisitor who became Pope. The identification of both institutions, the Inquisition and the papacy, with the cruelty that characterized them is unavoidable. Could the current emeritus Pope Benedict XVI forget such a noble predecessor in the Holy See, whose name was changed from Jacques Fournier to Benedict XII? Did Benedict XVI not take Benedict XII into account when he chose that same name to become the presumable Vicar of Christ before the millions of Catholics over whom he pretended to be head? That museum also had waxed figures of young ladies being mistreated in the dungeons by inquisitor monks and friars. Fourteen years earlier, a large notebook had been available at the museum for tourists to express their reactions when they had finished the exhibits. It is no longer there today. I remember some of the statements written by people who could not believe such brutality ever existed. They expressed their gratitude for not living at that time. I wrote in French a question which I signed at the end. What did the papacy not do that the medieval antichrist prophesied by the Bible did? We should recall that the holy office of the Inquisition was created by the papacy. There were some among the civil and ecclesiastical authorities who could not understand such a bestial instrument of extortion within what pretended to be Christianity. And let us not forget that Pope Innocent III was the Pope who conceived, established, and empowered the Holy Office of the Inquisition. The first official Inquisition was established in Languedoc in 1184. Its purpose was to exterminate the Cathar heresy. Originally, it was administrated at the local level, but was later centralized under papal direction to prevent provincial leniency. Pope Gregory IX eventually assigned the prosecution of the Inquisitions to the two great mendicant orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans. Not long after Innocent III had established the Inquisition, he claimed that he had been divinely charged with not only the universal church, but also the world to rule. This was the Pope who began a legal campaign of defamation and extermination of the friends of God or Albigenses and who expressed without shame that the Roman Catholic Church has authority to lie and kill in order to eradicate presumed heretics. He wrote to King Philip August of France to persuade him to launch a crusade to exterminate the abhorred Cathars in the south, saying, Rome doesn't tremble before the heresy. On the contrary, it considers it good policy to proclaim and exaggerate its virulence and organize under the sign of the cross a war of conquest which uh, will confirm in southern Gaul, neighbor of Spain and Italy, the power of the Pope. This must be a good opportunity for the Church through air of the Roman administration, to confirm its importance in the life of peoples and society. It is unbelievable, but it happened. This letter clearly indicates that it was not the doctrine of the friends of God that was the real issue. It was the authority of the Pope whose supremacy in religious matters the hated Cathars refused to acknowledge. The Cathars held that the millennial reign of the Roman pontiffs was in fact an evil empire, and amazingly, they were exterminated to hinder anyone from repeating the evaluation of this world as evil. 
In order to silence their testimony, the papacy resorted to defamation, slander, and mass murder as a warning to anyone who would dare to question the validity of his millennial kingdom. Keep in mind that Catholic scholastics like Thomas Aquinas had a hard time explaining the origin of evil from a philosophical viewpoint. They reached the ridiculous conclusion that evil doesn't exist, but only a lack of good. If someone needed to be killed for what they believed, why weren't the scholastics like was burned at the stake? The Catholic Church still stands within the walls of Carcassonne, but few people live in that old city. The authority of the bishop no longer resides there. Yet, oddly enough, tourists were 14 years ago required to keep reverence in the church. When we visited it a second time, it was under reparation. We visited many cathedrals in Europe where no reverence is required. What was the meaning of such reverence in this particular church? It is a way of saying that no matter what the people may say, Catholics were the overcomers. They are here today and the Qatars no longer exist. They don't take into account, of course, that the prophets Daniel and John had foretold the persecution of many like the friends of Jesus by an unmerciful political religious power which would apparently overcome them. Revelation 13, 7 says, It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them and it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation, which means that it would be a Catholic authority that is a universal power. But John was also shown the martyrs of the Middle Ages before the throne of God, having reached the everlasting redemption, Revelation 7, verses 9, and follows verses, and we have the same thing in Revelation 20. In this context, our attention is called to the Cathedral of Albi before the River Tam, a little more than an hour's drive north of Carcassonne. This is the city that gave its name to the Albigenses. After annihilating the Friends of God, the Roman Catholic Church built a tremendous cathedral there. Its construction required more than 100 years, from 1282 to 1392. The justification for this massive building was that the heresy was still concealed in that region. Its imposing presence was intended to silence any dissenting voice of future generations. As interpreted by Oshi, the author of a book on the Qatars, the construction of that cathedral was a way of saying, submit or be crushed. This mountain of bricks had 100 feet high per 300 wide and it is a monument of power. In addition to the false accusation of dualism, the friends of God wrongly called Qatars were accused of believing that the God of the Old Testament was bad and the God of the New Testament good. They were also condemned for considering ridiculous and deceptive all the scriptures except in the Gospels. But no Qatar text indicates that. Their writings prove that they quoted the whole Bible in fact, they promoted the Bible and shared it, even while the Roman Catholic clergy concealed it. It was said of them that they denied that Jesus was the Son of God. But their writings are full of statements that prove this contrary. In addition to their belief in Jesus as the Son of God, they believed in the Holy Spirit and preached on the need of receiving it, despite the fact that they lived at a time when the subject of the Holy Spirit was not too appealing. In other words, they were not Arians. They believed in the existence of the three persons of the deity. 
The friends of God were also condemned as denying the incarnation and the resurrection of Jesus. But there are manuscripts available today prove that they believed in the incarnation, sufferings, and death of Christ, as well as the resurrection of the dead. Fifteen kilometers north of Carcassonne is a little town called Las Tours. Three high fortresses are found there, each with its towers. Together, they form a notable castle known as Black Mountain. It is amazing to see how the princess of Languedoc could utilize those steep lobes for protection. The crusaders could not reach the principal fortress called Cabaret with their catapults. However, they could see from a distance what the people within the castle were doing. From Cabaret, we can see the valley surrounding Carcassonne. The Friends of God undoubtedly could see how the Crusaders filled the extensive valley formed by the river Old around Carcassonne. Cabaret became a place of refuge for the Friends of God so safely persecuted and destroyed by the Roman soldiers coming from France. A few weeks after seizing Carcassonne, Simon of Montfort went to Cabaret expecting to seize it too. But his army was repelled. The impressive cliffs convinced him that a long siege would be required. He considered this too high a price to pay when he had so many castles to conquer. After Simon left, the princess of Languedoc used Cabaret to stage a new resistance to the oppressing forces. Little by little, they managed to reclaim 40 of the hundreds of little castles which had submitted to the crusade through intimidation after the massacre of Bessieres. Simon of Montfort then resorted to his most cruel tactics to intimidate the knights of Cabaret. On April 1210, he seized Bram, a little town poorly fortified, after just three days of siege. He gathered 100 men from that city, pulled out their eyes and uh, cut off their upper lip, their ears and their noses. He then sent them to Cabaret on foot, heads down, each one with a hand on the shoulder of the one in front of him. They were guided by their chief, who had been left with one eye. They had to walk 35 kilometers through those ragged places. Cabaret would no longer be considered a center of gallant love. Instead, it became a place of lamentation. There, those 100 cruelly disfigured friends of Jesus were given care and Christian love. Those knights who dared to ambush and weaken the Catholic French troops that had remained after the Crusaders returned to France would also receive care in Cabaret. This cruelty was also revealed in the tortures inflicted on presumed heretics. It was the outcome of a pagan doctrine known as eternal hell. If God intended to burn the wicked eternally in hell, why could they not begin to process here on earth as representatives of God? That doctrine, however, is not found in the Bible and horrendously distorts the character of God. The wicked will be destroyed in a lake of fire, but that lake of fire will not burn forever. According to the Bible, those who end up there become ashes and no root nor branch will be left. They will no longer exist. 
only their punishment of non-existence will last forever. Hundreds of thousands of friends of Jesus were tortured and massacred as family destroyers. This accusation was based on the fact that their itinerant preachers practiced celibacy and opposed, presumably, the procreation of sons. But the Albigenses were known for having many sons. They multiplied to more than a million adherents in Europe. If many of them preferred celibacy and, vir celibacy and virginity, it was because in the intolerant time in which they lived, they accepted the statements of the Apostle Paul in connection with marriage, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, for instance, verses 32 to 34 and verse 38. They didn't impose celibacy, but only recommended it to their preachers of the gospel who lived in poverty. The itinerant preachers of the Friends of Jesus, wrongly called Cathars, would not maintain a family under the adverse conditions of their time. If we take into account that the Inquisition whipped from the map more than one million people in its horrendous massacres under pretext of destroying the family, it is hard to believe the seriousness of that accusation. It is even more difficult to believe the accusation of destroyers of the family when we take into account that the papacy had just forced many married priests to abandon their wives, requiring a mandatory celibacy for ministry and launching crusades with the purpose of crushing many priests who did not want to leave their wives and families. This accusation against the friends of God was constantly repeated during the 19th century by Catholics as well as Protestants in an effort to link them with the old dualism. For this reason, they did not try to understand the role played by the so-called Qatar woman. While during those dark centuries women were considered sources of corruption and carnality, the Albigensian women introduced a matriarchal revolution. They rarely traveled to preach, but they established homes for daughters and widows. The girls were educated in those homes to go into the war to marry and rear children who would also become believers in the faith of their mothers. Since the slander Cathars did not have churches, the homes that those women of God administered were transformed into worship centers led by those women where the preachers of the cities would come. It is obvious that the tremendous success of the Friends of God was due to that home worship in which they found a true spiritual rest and fortress. In southern France, they became a third to a half of the population, if not the majority in some places. When Bishop Fulk of Toulouse, one of the most bitter enemies of the Friends of God, reproached a Catholic knight for not punishing Qatar heretics, the Catholic knight replied, We can't. We have been educated in their midst. We have relatives among them and see them living perfect lives. It was too much to ask someone to apprehend his mother. It, explain, it explains why in that region there was such a strong resistance even among Catholics to the papal bulls which condemned the Cathars to the stake. Thus, the women who were denigrated by Catholicism at that time as sources of corruption occupied an honorable place in society among the French of God. The homes which those women administered kept their doors open to all and welcomed the people to hear the word of God. Those homes were not transformed into monasteries, but into centers of both manual and spiritual labor. Differing from the north in France, where inheritance passed to el the elder son, in the Languedoc they assigned an equitable proportion of the inheritance to all the sons. Women could also enjoy a certain independence which they could not obtain in the other European communities. Noble women founded, maintained, and led Qatar homes.